Hello, everybody. Turn this up in my headphones, Charles. You got it. Hello, everybody. We're back. We are back. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm here. <laughs> how's, how's that? How's that for you know, the, it's I just great. say I'm here. <laughs> He's here. You know him, the other friend, and uh, that's yeah, you, right, Charles? Yeah, yeah, that's also true. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, as the title says, we are here to discuss um, book one of the Poppy War series called "The Poppy War" by R. F. Kuang. Yeah, it's an exciting as... day. We had not originally planned to read this series at all. I didn't even know it existed until pretty recently. But um, this was the result of uh, Dylan's emergency meeting we had a week or so ago. I just started reading this on my own while we were in the middle of our Lord of the Rings buddy read. I got so excited that I made us stop everything and and read this. And... (laughs) Charles, flexible and willing as always, dove right in and, and cranked this out in pretty quick, Charles. I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I was able to turn it around in like a, a week's time, maybe, I will say. Um, testament to R.F. Kuang. You know, I before we really get into it, you know, we just came off of our Lord of the Rings buddy read and we've been reading that for like six weeks we've just were in the world of the lord of the rings reading tolkien and that's a very very different style of writing and it you know it it takes a lot mentally at least for me to kind of unpack all of tolkien's writing and take in all of the descriptions and the older language and and everything like that so i felt like i was just reading with kind of weights on and then once i picked up rf kuang her work was so contemporary her writing style was so contemporary it's like the weights came off and i just breezed through this just absolutely like tore through it and uh yeah it's pretty fast turnaround for me enjoyed it all for sure and not for a lack of a theme or substance or depth just a very quick read because of how i think the pacing goes and how really the dialogue more than anything is what sticks out to me as what's so modern and makes it flow so quick. Right. The dialogue, the pacing, the descriptions, they're all told in a very um, modern, contemporary way. And especially coming from as opposite of that as you can get with Lord of the Rings, I feel like in terms of fantasy literature, it, it just felt good to be back in reading something more modern and uh, I was you know I had a lot of new book energy especially after you called the meeting and you were raving about it you <laughs> you had my um interest peaked so by the time I finally got to crack the cover on it I was very excited and uh yeah it was a it was a pleasure reading so it delivered Charles it delivered um yeah poppy war highly recommend it do we want to get any more into describing the book before we just get into the meat of it, get into spoiler territory? No, I think it's time we just get into the thick of spoiler territory <laughs> at this point because we can actually direct any listeners who are looking for something spoiler-free over to the emergency meeting episode where mostly I discuss, because <laughs> you haven't read it yet, I discuss the book and mostly just rave about how much I really really enjoy this wonderful novel and i do it in a spoiler free way over on that episode it's probably called like emergency right it's something something. called like why we have to read poppy war something like that i don't think i put emergency in the title but maybe i did it's definitely in the description (laughs) (laughs) yeah emergency might be a little much so i think why we have to read poppy war's 
great behind the scenes work as usual, Charles. And as <laughs> usual, you. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, it hasn't Just aired show yet. Up, that episode recording. hasn't aired yet. We're too. We're way too far ahead. We're catching up slowly but surely. Um, so yeah, we have to just hold off on The Witcher a little while longer because we just had to get these books out. And so, uh, I mean, Dylan, you're the one that championed this buddy read. You want to um, take us into our first discussion? For sure. I thought, like usual, we could start with a recap of sure. this, and I was lucky enough to find something called recaptains.co.uk okay. that does recaps of books, and they had an awesome and short recap in addition to a longer recap, <laughs> but I'll read the short one, which is does have spoilers, so we're, we're heading there now, so... You've been Pop warned. out and listen to that other episode if you're still listening and don't want those spoilers. All right. Rin, a war orphan, works her butt off to get into Synagard Academy. She becomes an apprentice, an apprentice in lore under Master Zhang. War breaks out between the Nakara and the Federation of Mugen. Synagard is invaded. Rin joins the 13th Division and heads to Kirtalane. The siege on Kirtalane turns out to be a distraction as the Federation army is actually heading to Galanese. The psych reach Galanese and find it massacred. Alton and Rin go to the prison to release the gods, realize it's a bad idea, get captured by the Federation, and taken to a lab, which Alton sacrifices himself to burn down. Rin swims to Spear, summons the Phoenix, and destroys the entire island of Mugen. Then she sets her sights on the Empress. Okay, that's a very good summary. It is focused on the military movement aspect of it, but I liked it quite a bit. Very short and sweet. For sure, yeah. There's more time spent at the actual Synagard Academy and in the training than this probably implies. Right, but and Rin goes through a lot of stuff personally that this for description sure. doesn't cover, but it's a good plot by plot, like the more military aspects of it. And it touches on all the different kind of milestones that we're going to hit on in our in our buddy read discussion. Nice, yeah. So we have some plot point stuff that we just kind of want to talk about our reactions to the things that happened throughout this book. I divide that up into pre synagogue at Synagard, War with Mugen breaks out, and then Freeing the Gods, Capture, and End <laughs> sure. are my sections there. So I also have some interesting discussion topics that we'll bring up at the end if they don't already come up just as we're going through the Awesome. Loose discussion of the things that happen in this book. Where where do you recommend we start, sir? I recommend we start where Rin did, which is pre synagogue where she is basically being raised by the Fangs, who have been forced to take her in because she's a war orphan. And they're trying to marry her off to a much older man and Rin wants absolutely no part of that. Right. And she decides instead she's going to take what she sees as pretty much the only shot she has to get out of this situation. And she studies preposterously hard for this entrance exam that gives her a shot to get into Synagard Academy. Right. Uh, I think this is a great way to introduce the character you know like I, I like that we just got right to it it's like here's Rin she's someone who couldn't have dealt been dealt a worst hand in terms of <laughs> starting life and For sure and now her biggest her biggest problem is that she doesn't want to be doomed to a life married to this older guy and having no autonomy having no power and she like we're introduced to Rin's um, laser focus and determination right off the bat by watching her study for this exam ag against all the odds and her doing the math of like, okay, I need to study twice as much so I can only sleep for this many hours and this, that, and the other thing. And I need to just, I don't know, I don't understand these books. They're boring. So I'll just have to memorize every word of the books and, you know, things like that. Like she'll, see that she needs to get to A to B and just make the decision to do it 
and pursue it until she gets there, which is a very, um, you know, we always mention how much we like proactive protagonists here on the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast. So getting introduced to Rin right away as super proactive was uh, a really welcome sight for the two of us. Yeah, I got hooked so quick with this book because of exactly what you're talking about there, Charles. We get introduced to Rin and she is absolutely relentless when she has her mind set on something. And those are oftentimes my favorite protagonists. I think lots of people like that in their protagonists. And I I mean, one of the things that sticks out to me in these early bits is when her tutor, Tutor Feyrick, uh, tells her that story about this scholar that had to find a way to stay awake. And he (laughs) pins the end of his braid to the ceiling so that when he starts to nod off, his hair would yank him and the the pain would wake him up. And he's trying to say, like, isn't this too far to go to (laughs) try to study? And we learn so much about Rin that she completely misses that point and realizes, oh, if pain can help someone focus, then... I'll have to find a way to keep myself focused and awake. <laughs> yeah, she's like, that's a good idea, actually. Through pain. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, no, that's not what I was getting at. And she's like, no, the pain made him focus. Like, that's what she takes away because she's so single minded and Machiavellian almost in her pursuits of whatever it is she wants. And when right. she wants to take this exam and get into Synagard, then nothing else matters to her really. So she she starts engaging in this self-harm by dripping hot wax on her arm every time she starts to fall asleep. Right. And I, you know, I'm studying in psych right now, getting my PhD in counseling psych. And I really appreciate a depiction of self-harm where it comes from a place that is at least adaptive in some way because something i've i've learned in my experience in psych is uh, almost always when someone's doing something that we see as harmful to themselves uh, it's because it serves some sort of adaptive function for them right it may be not one that's actually overall making their life better or something that's helpful in all likelihood with self-harm it's not actually a big picture helpful for their life or healthy and at the same time there's a reason why they're doing it and i I thought this was a really good depiction of that aspect of it so we learn a lot about rin as good depiction right and it's interesting that kwong sets the stakes very low because we're just getting introduced to her so it's like rin needs to study for a test and ace a test And like she's doing that by harming herself, which we can understand and we can relate to and we can root for because her situation is so desperate and that she doesn't want to be married off. And we want her to get out of that and succeed and and gain her kind of independence and her safety pretty much. So we're... We're rooting for her along the way now. And, And I think, you know, one of the things we'll talk more and more about as we talk about this book is kind of RF Kwong herself is she has a very strong academic background. So as much as I'm sure Dylan, you can relate to the psych aspect. I'm sure there's also the, the late night studying aspect of it as well. And just to relate to that. (laughs) And the whole way she writes about exams and taking exams and studying for exams, it was very interesting and it felt like, you know, I, I don't have as much education as, as Kwong or as you but I can kind of I was like man she really like you can tell this is coming from an honest place and kind of writing from experience a little bit here when we get into these studying moments and these these moments of taking the test yeah I I've watched Kwong speak in some interviews so I'm not sure and in her Instagram live uh where she does drunk recaps of (laughs) 
at least she did one of the Poppy War, uh, which are really, I highly recommend checking her out on social media. We follow her and, and tweet at her. Uh, not too much avail yet, at least at the time of this <laughs> recording in terms of getting a response for from her. <laughs> but I really enjoy following her on these social media accounts because right. she's uh, a really interesting person. She's funny in the stuff that she posts and those drunk recaps are good too if you're about to start up the second book <laughs> and you want to know what happened in the first book. But anyway, I've heard her talk about uh, this stuff and she says that you can tell that Rin has a lot of the same uh, approaches that uh, her name's Rebecca Kwong uh, has in the sense that she thinks the <laughs> when she has a problem, oftentimes the answer is just study harder. <laughs> yeah. And Kwong says she she tends to do that herself, which I can relate to as an academic <laughs> myself. Yeah, right. No, I so I just I just was really I like these early moments, and it's also interesting to note the setting as well that we're getting painted here. Um, unlike all the other books that we've read on Friends Talking Fantasy so far, um, this one is heavily inspired by Asian history, specifically China and Japan. And it's really nice to to get away from that more European medieval swords and sorcery type setting and getting something um, completely different. And I think this, again, goes to Kuang's background and her knowledge of of Chinese history. Is right, Dylan? She's like a, um expert in like World War Two era China, Japan. Her under her undergrad, that's what she was mostly studying. And she this is a correction to something I said in the first uh the original poppy war episode that we did she was 19 when she started Crazy. writing this, this is... which is so impressive <laughs> i mean charles we knew each other at 19 i don't think we were gonna write any uh <laughs> really no. critically acclaimed <laughs> novels at that point <laughs> Definitely not. it's an amazing right. uh work of, of fiction especially for someone in their teenage years yeah so she was uh she ended up graduating with a degree in Chinese history from Georgetown. And that was a few days after the release of the novel that she graduated. So it was released awesome. before <laughs> she even graduated. Yeah, really impressive person and what she's accomplished here. But and now she... she's getting her PhD in, I believe it's Chinese literature, but I don't want to get that wrong. So <laughs> apologies. You're right. And but basically her strong background in uh, in Chinese history w was very informative for um, making this book. And I think I heard she had spoken at one point of being like, I just wrote the book that I wanted to read and couldn't find, which was a fantasy series uh, inspired more in, an, in a, like a Chinese setting and drew upon more of the history that she was reading, especially around World War II. And we'll get more into that later in the book because there's definitely a lot of things that happen that parallel uh, moments of Chinese history and Japanese history that are uh, very interesting <laughs> and intense. But for now, it was just really nice in these first in this first section of the book to be in that totally different world. It, it definitely stood out, and it was welcomed for sure. Definitely, and to be in that world, guided by someone who yes. has such a good understanding of it. And it becomes very apparent when you're reading this how well she understands the the topic. Yes, and that's, that's incredibly uh, well said. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so she, according to her website, started her PhD in East Asian languages and literatures. So, okay, that's, yeah, she's on the right path. I mean, she's she's already got a well published trilogy in the works. So mm. she's got a good command of literature. Um, for sure. So surprising no one, she aces the test. She does really well, and she gets placed in school, and she goes to Syndergaard. Right? Are we at? Are we ready to move on to that? Ready. I will say many of the things I highlighted <laughs> as on the Kindle when I was still reading that way before I ordered the hardcover because I was like, so much are from this part where we're getting right to know how relentless she is in studying. So it's, I think it's such a great intro, but I am ready to move on. Yes, let's do it. So at Synagard, there there's a bunch of different things that happen 
here. She kind of gets to see the city uh, and it's a big change. She comes from a rural area where this is a very different place. I think if we're getting into her actually starting up there, one of the first things she does, which is another great moment, is when she punches Nesha because <laughs> he insults Tudor Feyrek. Right. And, and we've been through this, like, kind of the school trope so many times. We've seen it with, like, oh, a Draco Malfoy type, or even, like, it's a movie trope of just, like, the school mm-hmm. bully. And it's very rare that the the main character getting uh, like picked on will just the first reaction is to punch the bully right in the face you know for sure and i love that so it was much, very almost Charles. cathartic to read that i know so it makes me think of king killer and you know i'm i'm a huge king killer fan so are you now charles sure. and i <laughs> i think when you say cathartic that resonates with the Ambrose Quoth dynamic is so much talk, so much bluster, so much of the time. Of course, there's times where it's not that. Um, <laughs> but in King Killer, it does feel sometimes like, all right, like these two just kind of snapping at each other. And to see Rin get there and say, okay, you've now crossed a line and I'm not going to take this anymore there's a line (laughs) in the book where it says rin took two steps toward the boy and punched him in the face (laughs) like she doesn't really know who he is at that point (laughs) right the boy (laughs) just like (laughs) it's so rin that she walks up and does that it's amazing, and it's also. I think at this point, also, what was bubbling up was the fact that, n- like, not only was Neza being like snarky, but there's also already been moments where she's outcasted for being from the poor province and from having mm-hmm. darker skin than everyone else, yep. which makes her um, a target of ridicule for her classmates. So she was already sensing those things, and we've we've kind of been there in fantasy a lot when there's you know racial tensions, and it was just. Um, really refreshing to just see the main character just go ahead and like skip ahead and just punch the person right in the face and kind of stand up for themselves right away and and it just kind of speaks to what we've already seen of Rin as being this like A to B determined determined character so it really um, that was a really fun way to kind of start this off and especially almost kind of like a take on this trope of being at school at the academy and and things like that of like you know it's not just going to be this snarky duel of words i'm going to actually do something about it i'm not going to tolerate it more than just the first scene you know so it was an interesting take on this whole at school setting trope that's become so prevalent in, in fantasy it felt like a very refreshing version of something we've seen a a decent amount of like Mm -hmm. you're saying charles and yes i guess we'll we'll keep rolling with some of this synagogue stuff she basically makes one friend (laughs) is probably fair to say during her time at synagogue right and that's kite and then you know classes get going she's kind of doing well in strategy under irja and yeah. She runs into trouble again in the combat classes where she gets into a fight now with Neja mm-hmm. and gets kicked out. Meanwhile, Neja, who we do find out is an extremely privileged person who has uh, who has a dad who's in charge of the Dragon Province. He he's like the basically gets no lead punishment. warlord. Yeah. So you're already seeing yeah. like classism playing mm-hmm. a part in her dynamic with everybody else. Like Rin's always kind of been an individual and by one, her personality and two, now that she's at this fancy school that no one from her province ever goes to, um, she's now individualized because of where she comes from and her background. So to see her try and navigate the politics of this military school at this point is 
very interesting and it's also familiar ground in the world of fantasy right we're used to the school setting we're used to classism and racism and things like that what we're not used to is Rin and how she <laughs> kind of goes through all these things so it's similar problems that we've seen so many times before but it, it's welcoming to see Rin's take on it like she although she does want to get along and she and she is she does get upset by the how classism and racism affects her day-to-day life. She's more interested in just beating everybody. And she doesn't kind of let the classism and racism get to her psyche too much as much as just like, I just want to be able to like beat everybody here and be more powerful than everybody here. And that is what drives her and that's what keeps her going at the front of everything which as someone who <laughs> enjoys reading proactiveness it, it was a really um really interesting take on the school because you could be like oh that's wrong and try and complain to like uh, the headmaster or whatever you know but or you could just be like i just need to learn how to be more powerful than him so i can destroy him at the next tournament which is is where the plot goes it's, it was a really nice it was a really awesome take that's also well said, Charles. I love your comment of what we're not used to is Rin. Yeah. Because it's, it's so true. I think that Quang does such an amazing job of depicting these aspects of oppression and of classism and just the discrimination that Rin faces and also empowers Rin in all of this yes. as someone who, yes, had had a bad hand dealt to her in terms of the way society treats her, like you said, Charles, and at the same time is such a force of nature in her own individual work ethic and relentlessness that she's not going to let any of that stop her from getting what she wants. Right, which is so well done. I can't tell you how many times I've seen like a fantasy TV show or read a book of fantasy where it's like, there's obviously racism going on and the theme is racism is bad. And you're like, we get that. We get that. But what was great to read here was how Rin chooses to face that adversity, which is by just um, channeling her determinism to making herself more powerful, which was, uh, which was, it's a hard thing to take a fresh take on, Oh, like classism and, and racism and fantasy. But Kwong does seem to have a deft hand and good understanding of how to kind of translate that to Rin's individual personality as a fuel for her motivation. That's not just the tropey, they were racist towards me and I'm mad now. It's like, no, I'm an individual. They don't get to do that to me. I'm going to do what it takes to beat them. You know, it, it, it was just nice to read after so many reading so many tropes in the genre. Yeah, I... Something that sticks out to me here, too, Charles, is this resonated with me as someone who's dealt with what I feel like have been pretty rigorous academic stuff I've had to deal with before, Mm -hmm. is (laughs) how hard she has to work when she's at Syndergaard. Compared to everyone else. It kind of reminds me of some of the stuff in The Magicians, Charles, Mm -hmm. one of both of us really love this one, but this is one that you you champion right. all the time on the show right. is The Magicians by Lev Grossman. And uh, where the school is something to want to get to, but that's not the end of the journey or the end of the adversity. In fact, it's only the beginning where learning the things you have to learn there is so hard. You have to study so much. And she's actually miserable a lot there. And I grabbed this line, which stuck out to me. But the misery she felt now was a good misery. This misery she reveled in because she had chosen it for herself. Yeah, very true. It's also a continuation of Kwong's ability to write about academia in a really honest, uh, mm-hmm. unique way, where they ha- everyone's like talking about the exams and talking about the teachers and asking what What are you going to major in? What are you going to you know? And um, just trying to everyone's different study habits and how everyone was just kind of so focused on the test and their grades or whatever that it became like the dynamic of the group and became this thing where it's like our pettiness 
kind of went away as we were all just trying to get by in the school which was also an interesting take on it. So again, her background in academia uh, really kind of fueled these parts. And it came off very honest and, and true and fresh uh, from her perspective in, in, these, in these moments at the school. Definitely, Charles. It's, it's a pretty grim, dark way of, of phrasing this, and that fits well with a lot of what Kwong does right. really <laughs> amazingly in this book, which does get labeled as grimdark a lot. Mm-hmm where it actually reminds me of something in uh, psych, a therapy that is called acceptance and commitment therapy. It's called Mm -hmm. ACT, which is, uh, it's basically focused on this idea that life is going to involve distress and pain and all this kind of stuff. And the best that we can hope for is just to accept that that's something that is going to be a part of life and commit, hence acceptance and commitment, uh, to a life driven by our values and our ideals in spite of, or probably the way they'd phrase it within the the literature of the therapy, with that distress. And it feels like, though, Rin will make some choices that <laughs> are probably not that value-driven <laughs> in the long run here, <laughs> uh, that... In some ways, Rin is kind of a master, at least early on of this. I accept that this path is going to cause me a ridiculous amount of pain, and I'm just going to do this anyway, because it's worth it. Right. And it's also kind of true, an interesting continuation of the conversation of like classism, where it's like that kind of that petty drama that we see in so many school school uh, setting fantasy books basically it was for lack of a better word cured by everyone being too busy studying to bother to be Mm. bullying each other where it was like yeah we were enemies and we still are but we're not like going at each other like you know harry potter and draco malfoy would be going at each other or even quoth and ambrose would be going at each other it's like we had no time for that we were studying and and kind of put all that away and, and it helps Quan kind of move the plot along while also being true to Rin's character while also setting the stakes. It's like, look, we cannot concern ourselves with that because we're operating, we're functioning at a whole higher level. We need to be working on our studies and to pursue, you know, this impending war that's coming our way, which it was a great way to set it apart from all these other series. <laughs> Yeah, and maintaining that even when the individual sides of that discrimination aren't as present, that the structural ones are still in place, one of which is the fact that Rin was kicked out already of this class and Neja was not, which guides us toward some other stuff that uh, Rin ends up dealing with, which her answer ends up being, I'm going to study more, and that's how I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to fight from books. Right. And she ends up in classic Rin fashion, just stealing a book from the equivalent of the archives. I can't remember what it's called. Like she's explicitly told, hey, you can't have that. It's like, okay. Then she just takes it. (laughs) And (laughs) yeah, she's... (laughs) It's like, I mean, it's hard not to draw some comparisons to Quoth and the King Killer Chronicle. Right, at, up to this point, certainly. It, yes. It's a very similar dynamic up to now, but mm-hmm. um, there is a, de- yeah. a very distinct departure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, a- everything becomes a big episode, kind of, in King Killer Chronicle of, okay, how am I going to get this? Bo-? And Rin's just like, this is mine. I'm taking it. I don't care what they just said. Yeah. And that is nice to see so then she's learning from the book it's not going particularly well because i imagine it's quite hard to learn how to fight from a book yeah and then zhang ends up coming and being like hey you're doing a bad job zhang is kind of the this wacky I we're talking about king type. killers it's it, like the elodin yeah. of yeah of poppy wars <laughs> yeah this kind, kind of, of like savant eccentric figure. guy and we've seen it in many places outside of just king killer and and poppy war but this eccentric 
master. Uh, right. And he's like, okay, I'll come train you. But and- what's interesting with Rin is like, Rin's like, I I just systematically don't agree with anything that you're saying, but <laughs> I, you're, you're my only way to learn more. So I'm going to just put all that away and learn from you. I do like that distinction because a lot of times we get these kind of savant eccentric characters and we tend to think that whatever they say is coming from a place of wisdom and power and all knowingness almost like they we rarely question them and Rin is like I want to believe him but he just seems so wrong and I can't accept his philosophies which is a really interesting dynamic that continues throughout the rest of this throughout the rest of this book but for now it adds an interesting kind of spin to Zhang's character and um the idea that Rin just decides to to learn from him anyway without accepting anything about his philosophies of why they're doing it she's just more like well I'm learning and that's all I care about for sure I think there are points where she's definitely considering the things that he's trying to teach her and she's she Rin also comes off as curious, I would think, and inquisitive. Yeah, especially uh, when it comes despite to fighting. Very, yeah, for sure. But even in his philosophy and stuff like that, but she doesn't just take it as gospel in the way that some other characters seem to do with their mentors, right? Quoth assumes that... I, I guess I don't want to spoil anything in King Killer in the middle of our no, popular yeah. episode. But some other people seem to feel that way about their mentors sometimes. And Rin, it, it builds on that Machiavellianism where she's like, ends justifies the means. I don't really yes. care what he's, all this babble. What I care about is learning how to fight. And there's a great quote I grabbed where it's, I don't want to read about balance in the universe, Rin grumbled, tossing aside what seemed like the hundredth text she'd tried. I want to know how to beat people up. (laughs) Very true. And she gets that opportunity in the tournament, I think, uh, to keep things moving. It's a pretty standard setup for a tournament, but Kuang just kind of breezes through it. I do like this moment in the book. It was fun to read all the different fights and who's fighting who and... And the build up to her ultimately confronting Neza again in the finals. And then, um, you know, something snaps in her in that moment. And that's when we finally get introduced to, after so long, we finally get introduced to the the magic system in this book. Which it was interesting to kind of put it off. And and we're almost like we're well over a quarter of the way through this book, right? I feel like we're... Uh, I would have to think... We're getting close to maybe 40% in. Don't quote me on this, but that would be my guess when the magic system starts showing up, really. Yeah. So, yep. really interesting um, introduction to that. And, of course, that gets more of Zhang's attention. And they study together. And that's when we finally start to learn more about how this whole magic system works and connecting with the gods and, and things like that. It is interesting to watch her go through this and trying to learn to meditate. And (laughs) that's so against everything that Rin seems to be about is just this idea of sitting still and just being present and not thinking about other things. Yeah, of course. She was like driving a pig up a mountain every day. And then she's like, the thing I hated the most was meditating. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I also love... so. The magic system, right? She starts burning and all this kind of stuff so she can actually just make fire appear almost like an avatar, the last airbender, firebender. Right. And then (laughs) that gets Jong's attention, but he basically just wants to teach her how to not use that power. And uh, (laughs) I also want to grab a quote that I love so much, which is, also, anyone this obstinate deserves some attention, if only to make sure you don't become a walking hazard to everyone around you. So that's her mentor's attitude about her power. Right. Well, what happened was she turned it on and then couldn't turn it off. She almost yep. killed Neza and she almost killed herself just by channeling that fire and not being able to stop it. And she described it as she could feel herself like burning from the inside. And she just had to keep destroying, destroying, destroying. And it wasn't until it wasn't until a young intercepts and like taps her forehead that she finally is able to come down from that state so it's already for us it's a justified concern that he wants to be like here's how to kind of 
stay cool and not like burn yourself up and everyone around you. And here's why it's super dangerous to consider that as a weapon because it's really just a force that you know nothing about that has the potential to consume you. So very interesting way to introduce our magic system. And uh, it's a fair a fair warning to how to to what it costs to use it as a as a magic system in the first place and is it even really a magic system it, it's it's an interesting kind of idea and philosophy this whole channeling of the gods situation definitely it's i can't think of other magic systems that are particularly similar or anything like that so that's mm-hmm. always a good sign when it's that original feeling I don't know if any come to mind for you, Charles. Um, nothing so directly. I mean, there is something like X Men where you're born with a specific power and you have no control over that. But this is so different. Mm-hmm. This is like you have a connection with a god, and then there's so much more to play it. Like when you can and can't use it, and like how drugs play an effect in it, and how like it's basically a death sentence for everyone that can do it, pretty much. And uh, it's it's very unique. Definitely. Well, we can keep this rolling then, well, Charles. I know. I, I think before we leave Synagard, we just have to talk about this moment that happens with Rin, where um, she's studying or training or something, and all of a sudden she gets like really ill and she starts to feel horrible. And the way Kwong describes it from Rin's perspective is that she feels this um, intense pain. And so we we're like, oh, that's just uh, it's just your time of the month, Rin, and that's gonna happen every month. And she's like, what? I, how do you? How do other women get along with it? Oh, it's like you learn to live with it, and you know, you, you, it's just a part of your life. And then she just goes, ah, uh, I'm not really feeling that. <laughs> I really can't afford to have any distractions from my studies. And she just gets a uh, drinks a little potion, which is basically giving herself a hysterectomy. Wild, wild stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's another thing that's not like anything I've seen depicted in fantasy before this. And it does help drive home how relentless Rin is, as yes. we've been talking about, in her pursuit of her goals. And something comes up for her where she's like, this is something that could get in the way of the thing I'm setting my mind to, and I'm just going to do whatever it takes to make that not an obstacle in any way. And and it's a pretty... Um, she makes that decision without any hesitation. It's mm-hmm. like from when that scene starts to when she's she drinks that potion is just a page or two you know it's like she's like this hap- this is gonna happen to me all the time like i know and i'm going to do this and then the doctor's like are you sure and she's like yeah and he's like okay and that's it <laughs> it was just very matter of fact she doesn't even think just even dwell on it doesn't think twice about it she's um she's no regrets very very committed to her pursuit of of power <laughs> for sure and yeah I'm going to tread lightly here, but from the perspective of a man reading that initial scene where she uh, gets her period for the first time was really interesting because I feel like a lot of times like Game of Thrones comes to mind where anytime a woman like gets her period for the first time, it's used in a way of like, oh, you're part of the moon cycle. You're a woman now. It's like... You know, that's how it's always perceived. But Kwong chooses to introduce it. Like Rin has no idea what it is. Like, and all we, she's just like full panic mode. And we're as the readers are in full panic mode. Like, what's happening? Is this the magic system coming out? (laughs) You know, and it's really just something that happens. It's just a really common part of nature. And I was like, oh, interesting. It was like a really unique perspective. And I think Kwong one of the things I really admire about her voice as an author is that she's able to take these different approaches to what we've seen for school and what we've seen for racism and then what we've seen to like being a woman in a fantasy world. It's, I thought it was a very eye-opening perspective for me as someone who 
is not familiar with anything about <laughs> that whole world of being a woman, I, I really liked it. And I thought it was a great, a great scene and a great description. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah. Um, also, a, a cis man who's never <laughs> experienced menstruation, and right. uh, to see Rin, especially someone who comes from this background where we get the sense she hasn't really gotten the sex ed- sex education that would prepare her for this, to have this moment come out of nowhere for her, right. and to kind of be so close in Rin's perspective, which we are throughout right. essentially all of this novel. Like it feel I said this in our first Poppy War episode, it feels like it's almost first person with how close we are to Rin's perspective, another testament to Kwong's writing. And it's it comes if I'm remembering right after she takes a, a big hit in the fight yes. with Nezha. Yes. It so does. we're like, is this some sort of reaction her body's having to that right. hit? And we're worried about her. She's worried about herself. And we're like, what is going on? And then uh, she has her period. And it's just this shocking moment for her. And it's right. shocking for us if we've kind of let Kwong, which I did, like mislead us as to what was yeah. actually happening. Right. And uh, then... I think it, I don't know, it does a really good job of depicting that experience in a way sure. I've never read before. Yeah, so, I know. It was yeah. definitely unique. It was definitely a moment that stands out in the whole book, uh, which is just a testament to, to Kwong's writing. I think it was very successful. Um, you know, I was peering through the reviews, and a lot of the critical reviews get kind of upset about this whole hysterectomy thing, but... You know, from my perspective, I see it as a testament to Rin's character, which is this, like you said, Machiavellian A to B. I need to focus on like doing well at the academy, and I can't tolerate any distractions. It's part of her extremism, and I just think that's a amazing way to write in to her character just about how extreme she goes and what measures she takes uh, to get to where she wants to be. And I thought it was a was a really telling moment of her character i thought it was really unique and what a crazy decision to make and what a unique standout moment of the whole book i agree charles i mean obviously we've been clear that with our identities it's hard to speak to the experiences some people might have reading this yeah coming from a place of positivity yeah and i can say the way that i personally took this was it's not necessarily glorifying Rin's decisions. A lot of Rin's decisions are, I mean, she makes ones that are are legitimate war crimes yeah. and things like that too, that I don't think are glorified. No. We're supposed, I, my sense was what yours was too, which is Rin will do whatever it takes to achieve the things she wants to achieve. And as soon as she saw a potential barrier to that, she, she didn't even consider any ramifications, but how do I get rid of this? Like, and I don't think it's necessarily glorified. Like I was saying, no, it's yeah. just it's, a decision she makes because of who she is. It's an extreme decision. And one she makes very quickly. And I, that's mm-hmm. just telling of her character. She'll make these really serious decisions very quickly when she knows where she needs to get to. And this is just one of those early telling moments of what she's capable of later on, which we can get into now as we leave uh, as we leave Syndicard. For sure. I'll drop a line quick, too, before we do leave mm-hmm. Syndicard, which is that I do like when she visits Kite's estate and gets to see how That's these we- wealthy folks are living and gets that perspective because that was another moment that I thought was a beat that I've seen hit on before but I'm not in fantasy Uh, but I'm not sure as well as I thought it was done here by Kwong so all right well then I I will get into the Kite's estate situation because I I think what I really liked about this is that Kwong does an amazing job of depicting 
this class difference as a structural issue rather than a individual issue Mm -hmm. by not demonizing Kite or his father in any ways. In fact, I think the way she portrays Kite and uh, Kite's father is... they come off as very yeah, nice. I people. like Kate. He's well, one of the most like I self-identify with Kate more than anyone else. I mean, I'd be as lucky to be like him. As, like I'm not as <laughs> smart and as capable as he is, but I still feel like he's one of the more relatable. He's like the voice of common sense throughout the whole book. You know, he, he, and uh, I'd agree with that. And you know, I think he's a pleasure to read. And the fact that he's from one of the wealthiest families and he grew up with Neza and they're from the same environment, but his his ability to kind of understand that and be able to relate to Rin more just from knowing like, look, this is just some classist baloney and I'm I just see you as a capable individual and I admire a lot about you as a fellow student and it was really nice to see i agree you touched on a really good classist like systematic versus individual relationship that was really well constructed by Kwan. for sure i mean it's it's really interesting to see that i think that a lot of times the way that an author will try to drive home a point about classism at least in fantasy it'll be something more along the lines of like, see how bad these people who have the money all are. Yeah, exactly. uh, And they're flaunting it and they're mean. And and some people are like that in the Poppy War. Right. And then some people are not like that, but they also have places where they, you know, they can like, like kid A try to sympathize and all this kind of stuff. But just have such a vastly different life they could never really understand what Rin's experience has been like. Absolutely. And it feels that way. And I think that's such a nuanced and well-developed way to depict this issue. Yeah, very well said. And that was a fun moment just so that not only to for like how the other half lives, but also kind of gives Rin this this... It definitely impacted her in like, wow, this is what power can get you kind of also. So there's like that two-sided piece of it where it's like, wow, the city's really nice when you can afford to have power and things like that. So she, um, it was definitely um, a lot of different uh, dynamics going on in that really short like side plot scene. <laughs> yeah, and... <laughs> She also really likes that figurine that they see at the the pee pee boy. Like she it's yeah, hilarious. I was so glad that that came up because as a as someone who is a big uh, tea aficionado, to see the pee pee boy in the book <laughs> was I was like, oh, because I, I was reading, it's like, oh my god, it's pee pee boy, and then they actually wrote in they called it the pee pee boy statue thing. It's a very real mm-hmm. thing. The idea of it is there's water inside, and when the outside gets hot enough, it pushes the water inside out through the hole and it looks like the statue's peeing and that's just kind of a way to see if your water temperature is is hot enough for tea it's like a tea pet but like a joke one (laughs) (laughs) well rin was really amused by it and this is something i hit on some in our we have to read the poppy war episode uh, which is something i love so much about rin is that you really do get to see Rin's human side consistently throughout this. Mm -hmm. And I think we've contrasted her with some other (laughs) protagonists in grimdark fantasy who don't get as (laughs) (laughs) well-rounded depictions. I know uh, we love Mark Lawrence on this show and uh, Jorg from the Broken Empire. Mark Lawrence never really tries to depict picked as particularly uh well-rounded he's just a like a villain who happens to be the main character right and rin we get to see like she laughs she cries she has all these emotions throughout she does the have story. a bit of a sense and, of humor also yeah in her inner monologue kind of definitely and I mean, she cries pretty early on when she gets to Synagard too because uh, of how hard all this is to deal with and i think and we understand her motivations like no one wants to marry a creepy old guy and live a life of obscurity as a peasant definitely don't want that (laughs) 
And yeah, I think that all helps serve the eventual purpose that anyway of what I perceive as the purpose of this uh, novel, which is to show Rin's corruption and what ended up leading her down that road. And I think being able to show a, a well-rounded full human make these decisions rather than you know in, in psych we don't actually use the term sociopath to it doesn't mean anything but that's kind of the colloquial language <laughs> around how we describe someone like Jorg is like this quote unquote sociopath who doesn't feel empathy right, right. Rin feels empathy and she has very real emotions. yeah the Jorg Rin comparison is a very interesting one because they're alike in so many ways it's just Jorg is totally an for lack of a better word unlikable in that you're never like you would never want him to be your friend because he's very evil like and he's always been evil and he he doesn't like anybody and rin actually has wants and fears and desires and we we are siding with her york has lots of desires (laughs) yes he does but rin it's like we're rooting for her like we want her to do well in the exam like it's a thing that's as harmless as as studying for an exam but it's telling of what she's capable of which gets yeah through the power of fantasy literature gets put up to the nth degree of like channeling a god to simulate a nuke so it's like it's, it, it starts with the burning yourself to study in the exam and it piles on and we get these moments like with kate that we are reminded that she is a human being and that she is like struggling with these things so uh, it's a really great moment to kind of highlight and I agree completely <laughs> so, it's reminding us that she is uh, human and that we do like her as a person and that just makes her decisions that she makes that's much more difficult and tragic later on as Definitely. the stakes in, go up in different circumstances Rin might have been a, a talk about a school setting it's almost like harry potter where you write yourself into this thing where it's like okay now he has to be in year one now he's in year two Mm -hmm. now he's in year three and this is like no 
we did the school thing and now there's no school <laughs> it's like instead of like trying to force myself to write like three more years of school let's just get to the next story that i want to tell and it's not in the patrick rothfuss way of like i could tell that part of the story but it's not interesting but it's like no actually we got attacked and now we're in war now well that's what i want to get at charles yeah. and i'm i'm trying to get not to get too riled up i don't want <laughs> What, what were we talking about before the show? Like the Ollie get my sword yeah. thing <laughs> for the the listeners. We uh, we were messing around with a Jon Snow soundboard, and one of the sound bites was like Ollie get my sword. Or, it's probably oh, more than that. But Dylan's rallying uh, cry for when he gets on his rants. <laughs> yeah, so I'm trying not to have an Ollie get me my sword moment right here uh, <laughs> and stay composed, but. I feel like this is something that actually compounds how Kwong is able to get across the brutality of war stuff, which is such a theme in this story. It's jarring for us to move quickly from, hey, weren't we just in school, to, oh, now there's a war just happening here. And if it's jarring for you as a reader then that's probably good because that's how it feels to Rin and to her classmates. It's not like they get to finish and graduate and move on and then the war starts and that all happens quickly. It happens quickly because in the real time, all of a sudden they're just at war and every their lives get interrupted. And that's how we feel as readers too. And I think that reaction that you're having is... is good for driving home the point that we get and the stark contrast between the war and the school story i think helps make you see oh my this was like one of those young adult books almost that i've read right. before where someone was at school and now they're killing people it's like yeah they're yeah. they're teenagers killing people it should feel like that yeah incredibly well said i i, I think that um kwong's deliberate decision to kind of build you up with the familiarity and then to change it abruptly one it's just a a dramatic moment when they get attacked like that alone is just an interesting thing but two it speaks to by the time you get to the end of this book the progress that she's been able to achieve and the amount of growth and development that she's had to have the amount the setting and the world around her gets to develop it is so well earned by her by Kwong's unabashedness when it comes to just being like and now everything changes and everything changes again and everything changes again you know it's like this is wartime and you know we don't need to have these lull moments just to make the story feel like it's progressing at a slow pace it's like look these attacks are happening and it's forcing them to move on and think about how far we've come from this girl studying for a test and it also speaks to kind of like we were talking about with getting to know Rin and get to fall in love with her, it's also this idea of like all these things that were kind of problematic, but not a big deal because she was at school and it's cool to becoming like, okay, it's actually fueling her to be this sort of um, weapon of mass destruction, this war criminal. So um, no, just if you're going to have someone go from a student studying for a test to a war criminal, you, you got to move at this pace. <laughs> so I just thought it was really well earned and a really interesting decision for an author to make. And as a reader, I appreciated it because sometimes people, authors write themselves in these creative holes. Like I, I'm going back to Harry Potter. It's like, great. Now they have to go back to school. But it's like, what happened to Quidditch class? We're not doing Quidditch class anymore. It's because like, <laughs> you know, you write yourself into these things. And uh, Kwong did a really interesting way of kind of getting herself out of that. And it's like, I could write about three more years of school. It's just not interesting. <laughs> it's not what the story I want to tell. Pretty much seems that way from her. And I, my, was it? I'll give her a tip of the hat. For <laughs> 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 trying to think of that. <laughs> uh, tip of the hat for her willingness to just tell us what we need and move on i think yes. that's such a skill that she has 100%. and uh maybe we could probably take a, a tip from her in our <laughs> podcast <laughs> so yeah. uh shall we <laughs> with that in mind get through this initial attack and, and call this an episode yeah i 
think, you know, we got to a great, everything kind of changes for Rin at this moment. So we may as well kind of take this moment to pivot ourselves for our first ever uh, two-parter buddy read discussion. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the Poppy War has a lot of firsts on our podcast. Yes, (laughs) it's been very disruptive this whole time. And you know, I think that's what Rin would have would have wanted <laughs> wonderfully disruptive just yeah, like red exactly um any other parting words before we move on before we play the outro i guess <laughs> uh i don't know i'm just so excited we're talking about this yes yeah, so we're, we're only halfway through our discussion you know we were we were talking about it and it's, we have so much to say why limit ourselves to our one hour one hour 20 minute max when we can split it over two episodes. So you d- don't worry. Our conversations will continue in the next couple of days. We won't wait a whole week to get this part two out to you guys. And uh, that being said, let's get this outro music going. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. If you enjoyed our discussion of Poppy War, come back in the next couple of days when we do our part two of the discussion of our Poppy War buddy read by rf kwong you do not want to miss it somehow i think we went our whole part one without mention mentioning alton <laughs> which is pretty surprising he becomes a lot more relevant later on but... yeah yeah we'll yeah. we'll get to him we'll... it'll happen <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned for that listeners. yes yeah so <laughs> all that and more and our oh, part two. Follow us on the FDF podcast on, let's say, that's Instagram and Facebook. We're at the FDF podcast. Mm-hmm. We're also at the FDF podcast.com. And we're at the FDF podcast one on Twitter. That's the number one. Hit us up. Yeah. That's the number Hit one. Hit us up. Hit us up. And uh, yeah. rate five stars on Apple Podcasts and all that good stuff. If you like it. If you like it. If not, we are always wanted to hear from you we're open to in feedback. other formats that <laughs> don't affect our ratings yeah. or do if you really want to but we'd rather not we can't stop <laughs> you but and we only have like four reviews so we couldn't to refi- this point yeah. Charles. <laughs> to this point um well that's all for now thank you everybody and as always go phone conquer friends